Options TV and today we're going to talk about a survey made by Deloitte. It's one of those important surveys coming out each year. Since when have you been doing this survey? This is now our 10th edition. 10th edition already, okay. So we know of another survey, right? But talking more maybe of brand performances, uh, whereas here we're going to talk more about trends in a certain way, evolutions of patterns, whether it's on the consumer side or on the brand side. So 2022 has been a record year for the Swiss watchmaking industry. How are the outlooks for uh, 2023 so far? Yeah, interesting question. Thanks, Marc Andre, for asking. Um, what is interesting, we are asking the watch executives this year, we have 75 on what is their impression and their outlook for the Swiss industry as a whole, uh, for the export industry and then for the watch industry. And in 2022, we saw an upward trend. So moder moderately positive on the Swiss, indus uh, um, Swiss industry as such, but for the watch industry, they were more bullish. Mm -hmm. This year, it's a downward trend. Mm -hmm. So they are still positive for the Swiss uh, industry, but for their own industry, meaning the watch industry, they're a bit more reluctant because there is some softness currently in the, in the feeling of executives. We have feeling, but do we already have a few numbers that would kind of uh, confirm this? Well, it's still a record year. If you look so at, the, at the volume and the value, it's still a record year. There was a bit, it was softening a bit in July and suddenly everybody says, see, it's here finally. The slowdown is here because it has been just amazing since COVID mm -hmm. and uh, the, the industry has been picking up like crazy. But again, August was a very strong month and we are heading to another record year this year. So the softening has not really started yet. Okay, but the general impression of uh, executives definitely is going a little bit more on the cautious side. Yes, because of course they do see inflation, they see the very strong Swiss franc, uh, I mean there is still bottlenecks, the overall geopolitical situation. So the economy is a bit disrupted and it's very difficult to do predictions and of course China and the Chinese consumer there is not the big shopping habits have not come back yet. So what impact do you think this has in terms of the operational side of the businesses of the, the watchmaker in terms of how they're handling their retailing, how they're handling distribution, how they're handling product development? Oh, well, overall, the industry is uh, disrupted a lot. So it's, it's not only the volume, it's of course the innovation that is coming up. Uh, it's the change in consumer. They waited the purchase, they waited to interact. So uh, brands are adapting. So we call really it rooted in tradition because tradition is very important in the watch industry, but innovation is strong and the transformation is strong. So the, the, the brands as well as the retailers are all adapting and um, in taking you know, technology and other innovation into, into play. So coming back to this report, what are the main trends that uh, you have witnessed. And maybe before coming into the details, can you t tell us again a bit the, the methodology that you, you are using for this? Yes. Yeah. So um, you were referring to other studies that are out in the market. And of course, these studies are trying to figure out um, what is the volume sold, what is the turnover, uh, what is the, the, the market's size and impact. We are trying to uh, grasp, grasp the sentiment, the sentiment of the industry, meaning that we are um, surveying, in this case, 75 executives of brands, of uh, distributors, as well as uh, com component manufacturers and experts. We do expert interviews the whole year. And then we are putting this in parallel with what the consumer really wants. So we're serving, uh, serving 6,000 consumers this year. Uh, last year it was 5,511 countries. Now we have a 12th country, India, where we did a little spotlight um, because we believe it's important to see one thing is what, what the, the industry thinks, but one thing is what do the consumers really want. And that is um, the, the methodology that we use for the survey. But the, those people uh, participating on the consumer side, I guess they are people that are already kind of aware about watchmaking Not or no. Okay, so Not it's really... Uh, it's really a, a, con a con l lambda consumer. Okay. Some might be interested in watch and some might not. All right, okay, interesting. Mm -hmm. And that obviously has an impact on the numbers that you find. Absolutely. Um, so coming back on the, the, the areas uh, that uh, you were mentioning, yeah, I mean, uh, just uh, India a little bit. U.S. is still very strong. Very strong. Uh, can you give us a little bit uh, some uh, summary of uh, what uh, have you, you've witnessed? Yeah, so maybe um, um, first of all, we can speak about um, sustainability. Uh, was an interesting point last year where we said, well, why are brands going into sustainability and even issuing ESG reports? One of the findings was last year, well, it, consumer are asking for it and it's good for my brand image. Mm -hmm. So it was more the market pushing and it was the, the and marketing as such, uh, eminence marketing. Now it's fully embedded in the brand's strategy. 
in one year we saw this shift. Okay. Okay, it's because, I mean, it's uh, so often the sustainability officers are part of the executive board. Um, the, the CEOs have embraced it and it's part of their corporate strategy. So this is one important shift with, which we think is a, is, is a key finding. And regarding sustainability, from what point do you take it? Uh, I mean, is it only talking about uh, material sourcing or, or is it the overall production process? Yeah, it is, it is the different materials that you use in, in your watches, the innovations that you put in place, but as well it can be, of course, participating to ethical sourcing, to traceability of where your material comes from. Um, it is as well uh, overall the consumption that you as a company make, uh, the reporting and the transparency that you have on your overall impact and footprint of, this, of the ESG. So it's really a very broad um, definition of sustainability. So if this has been taken into consideration by the brands themselves, have you seen also a shift in terms of the, on the consumer side? Is it just confirming a bit more that, it, uh, that those uh, values are more prevalent? Yes, but <laughs> as usually, um, consumers don't really want to pay additional for any sustainability efforts. They think it should be part of what the company does. And we see as well, the younger the consumers get, the more it is important to be uh, aligned with the values that the companies are representing. So it, you would not necessarily buy a watch because it's sustainable, but you would not want to buy a watch of a brand that doesn't embed sustainability in its core. So that is, that is a shift that the companies just have to take and now do take as well. Um, and we are always ask the question, if you have a, the choice between a sustainable watch or a, a, a watch that you like the brand image, which one you choose? Last year it was a bit in between, now the sustainability becomes more important, but again for younger consumers. And does it change per continent? Um, there is some different uh, trends, but it, the top three reasons why you buy a watch is not yet sustainability in almost all of the countries that we've surveyed. Okay, mm -hmm. not too surprised. <laughs> so you, you talked about traceability, mm -hmm. and that leads maybe to uh, what brands can do to uh, guarantee a better, better traceability. Yeah. Uh, what evolution have you witnessed there? Um, yeah, so we see, I mean, traceability goes with technology mm -hmm. because often there is different blockchain technologies, for mm -hmm. example, that are being used now for traceability. Um, we see that the market is still a bit scattered mm -hmm. in the different solutions of traceability that is offered. Uh, but more and more brands are trying to have ethical gold, ethical steel, um, and materials that you can really have as well, not only you know where it has been produced or extracted, but there is no child labor involved mm -hmm. for ethical considerations mm -hmm. as well. But by traceability, I was also referring to the fact that you know the watch has been produced by, uh, I mean, from this batch. I mean, if so in terms of uh, all the counterfeiting and things like yeah. that, uh, because I mean, we've been talking about this since years and years, but do you see actual um, uh, decisions made by uh, brands that really go into that direction? Well, more and more brands offer the op opportunity to have a, a, an NFT or a digital certificate that is on blockchain. But often a digital certificate is certifying the watch as such and the owners of the watch that the warranty work has been done uh, to, to trace for the fully, I mean, the provenance and is still another step yeah, because it's of course, technically yeah, yeah, com uh, yeah. complicated to yeah. do. Uh, but we see now with, with Aura Blockchain, Ariani, Origin, I mean, there's sev several solutions that offer this as well. And a lot of brands like for example, Panerai just started as well to offer again to, to subscribe to, to a digital warranty uh, that is on NFT. Um, um, Breitling offers on all, all their watches. Uh, you, we see that uh, um, Breitling doesn't want to offer, announce that they wouldn't use any um, uh, diamonds anymore, only Lapron diamonds from 2025. So more and more are, are moving into that direction now. Mm -hmm. In terms of uh, retailing and distribution, mm -hmm. there's been a major announcement at the Thank end you. of uh, the summer uh, with the acquisition of Boucher by uh, Rolex. What impact do you think it has and why it happened now? In this the impact, it was a shock for everyone. <laughs> Quite a revelation, I would say, because it's one of the biggest M&A transactions in the, in the recent mm -hmm. years. Uh, we have observed since years uh, brands buying component manufacturers. I mean, that was really the trend. It's not only, um, well, it's mostly to secure production. Mm -hmm. uh, we've seen it as often these, these um, comp uh, component manufacturers are quite um, qualified and specialized. They don't only work for the brand that acquires them, but they stay multi-brand. Mm -hmm. To my point on uh, Rolex and Boucher, Boucher is of course a, a multi-brand retailer. Rolex acquiring it, Boucher was one of the biggest um, retailers for, for Rolex. Question now that the market is asking themselves, will it stay multi-brand or will it become an exclusive distributor for Rolex? 
Um, so far, we have heard that, it, that they should continue to work as they did. Um, the parallel that we pulled here is, is uh, with uh, Richemont buying um, net apporté that then became Hughes net apporté mm -hmm. They continued as well mm -hmm. to have a marketplace that is multi-brand mm -hmm. and not only servicing their own brands. Yeah. So there has been examples in the past, um, and we'll see what, uh, what comes out of uh, the Rolex uh, Boucher deal. Mm -hmm. Well, with that last example, that didn't end up such so fantastically. But uh, here, I'm sure everything is much more secure. I mean, we're talking more also traditional retailing in a certain way, even though the level of experience that those retailers are now bringing to their consumer has changed and evolved quite significantly, no? Yes. I mean, Rolex had historically not uh, taken the decision not to move into retail. Mm -hmm. I mean, they had the distributors, and that was their model, yeah. and they didn't want to move into another direction. I mean, here as well, of course, Boucher uh, was uh, with succession questions, so the timing yeah. was dr was driven more by succession than any um, strategic consideration, probably. Um, but you're right, the retailers and Bucher themselves. I mean, you, you look at their their e-commerce uh, opportunities, their expansion internationally, uh, their their um, partnership now that they have with um, with Sotheby's. Uh, Sotheby's in Zurich. Uh, they sell pre-owned watches on My Theresa as well. So. The, the traditional retailer that had a few shops and was was face-to-face um, -face interacting with clients is moving into a, a multidisciplinary ecosystem. And this can be said also for the brands themselves since they're opening much more yes. their own boutiques. Absolutely. Yes. And what do you think they're looking uh, with this? What's their main target? What's the, the main purpose? Well, uh, um, overall, it's, I mean, just to set the scene again, we, when we ask the question, where do you think that most of the consumers will buy their watches? I mean, the executives are clear, it will be in store. Mm -hmm. when, we, when we ask the consumers, depending on the countries, and India, again, is an outlier where over 60% would buy their watch uh, online. Most of them, 45% still uh, want to buy, uh, only want to buy online, and most of them buy in store. So, of course, the in store experience becomes important, but customers entering the store are much more informed. I mean, they have informed themselves online, on social media, so you have to offer something different. Mm -hmm. So it's more the, um, the AP house or, or flagship store, immersive experience to get the brand experience that you cannot get through um, digitally so easily. That makes a difference. And we see that the interactions now in person, and that's one of the other findings, the interpersonal experience become more important again. I mean, imagine Watches and Wonders, it was digital during the pandemic, became hybrid, but the more and more people are coming, and not only the, the distributors, but as well the general public. I mean, the two days for the public have now become three days for the public because people want to interact. And the, and the online auctions have grown drastically during pandemic, are again stagnating online because people want to have the experience and the fever of an, of a, of a, an auction that is in person. Mm -hmm. But coming back to the, the watch events, uh, one of uh, the findings uh, of your studies shows that today executives are perceiving these uh, venues as being much more significant and purposeful as only one year ago, no? Absolutely. Because two years ago when I spoke with watch executives, I said, well, why would I wait for an event that is only once a year? I do launch my collections now six times a year. I can interact directly doing a roadshow, digital roadshows. I can, I, I can really have more personal interactions with a la larger audience. But you see that, in fact, in the end, these big fairs, they drag public, they drag professionals. And you can make a big impact by being there in person. And and the the, the I mean, you, you've been all through the watches and wonders. It was amazing this year. Huh? The positive vibe, the experience, the, the, the to, to see how the, the watch industry has evolved was just amazing. And I think this this personal communication. Plus now, I mean, they even want to make the direct selling at watches and wonders. Before it was more a B two B. The collection will come out in eight months. Now the collection comes out soon, and now it will be maybe let's already make a transaction at the fair. So the agility and the see now, buy now, which becomes more important for consumers when they are so used to buy online, is, uh, is, is really growing. But uh, talking about uh, see now, buy now, we still have uh, uh, supply issues. Yes. <laughs> uh, and we're seeing that the consumers today are not necessarily wanting to wait that long anymore. Yep. Uh, tell us a bit more about that. Interesting, yeah, because of course, um, right, most of the consumers, they always want to, we say personalization is important, but in the end, a lot of people want the same watches because then they're recognized, they, they gain in value. So it's certain models that are most, most requested and where the waiting lists are the longest. Um, but look at the numbers as well, how the industry has grown. So of course, uh, I mean, to manufacture a watch takes time, to develop a model takes time, there is limited um, supply available. So there is a lot of investments of brands to 
produce more, but it will still take time. When we looked at, at the fact that why, do a consumer, why does a consumer buy pre-owned, often it's, well, because it's more interesting from a price perspective. You can get access to a maybe a more luxurious watch for the same price than you could buy for another one. But a lot as well because they don't want to wait. Uh, because the waiting is, I mean, you have to wait one, two, three, four, maybe 10 years. Sometimes you don't even know if you get on the list and you have it immediately available. But then there's a price upside. Of course, you have to pay more. Um, and as well, when models are discontinued, with, which comes more and more to keep the value up, uh, then you would buy it uh, and pre-owned. Mm -hmm. Because we've asked the brands as well, do you actively manage your pre-owned, the pre-owned market? Um, because the pre-owned price is, is a signal for the primary market, of course. If your watch loses value immediately when you leave the store, maybe that's not the most um, uh, well-loved um, piece. So um, still half of the brands do manage the, the, the pre-owned market, meaning that they discontinue models or they might actively buy again or they, they, have, they would check the supply in order to make uh, the watch not too spread around um, the ecosystem. But the fact of having consumers, uh, I was reading in, in your study that like 58% said, okay, well now I don't want to wait and I go to something else, mm -hmm. meaning that, okay, it creates a new demand on other models and mm -hmm. for new brands, uh, not necessarily new brands, but I mean, it's yeah. good opportunities yeah. uh, for them. Uh, if there is a little shift on the market, uh, will they, the consumers still would be willing not to wait uh, that, that that long. I mean, I mean, what I mean is that will they go back to their Traditional. original choice? Probably it's, yes. Yeah. Because I mean, I think that a lot of new brands have as well benefited from the fact that the, the established brands there is a lot of waiting, and they uh, that gives the opportunity to get more shelf display as well to have maybe somebody turn to a more innovative brand, that less well known brand. The question will be when, as you mentioned, there will be more supply. Will the, the demand on these these uh, innovative watches remain? So what are the kind of the dark clouds that you see today for the industry? Um, or, I mean, perceived by the executives, of course, yourself, and uh, if you have any insight from the consumers. Well, I um, need to think hard because, I mean, the challenges have always been there. Huh? Mm -hmm. There is, uh, I mean, for example, labor. We didn't speak about labor. Mm -hmm. uh, you might invest into production facilities. Uh, you might be able to get uh, ethical gold and ethical steel if there is nobody to do the, to prepare to set up the watch yeah. and to have qualified watchmakers as well little hands that work on it, then you have a challenge. Yeah. And the, the qualified labor is top of minds of executives and top of mind as well of the so component manufacturers. That is a very important part, I think. And Switzerland is not that big. It takes time as well to make qualified watchmakers, so that will be uh, one of the challenges that is coming up. Did any of those executives tell you what could be uh, an answer for this? Well, you see that the, some brands are opening their own schools, they're investing in apprenticeships, they want to open their own f training facility. I mean, Rolex historically had already training facilities and a good, very good program, mm -hmm. Swatch. Swatch Group is always telling on their press release how much apprenticeship they have, how much I mean, people they have trained. And now we see that even uh, I mean, recruiting agencies like ADECO, they have a, a training facility. Um, it's a two-week understand if people have the, the, the manual skills to be a good watch um, component um, worker. Um, but more and more people have see these needs and, and, and try to help the industry. Mm -hmm. And obviously, I mean, we're surrounded by geopolitical uncertainties yes. and obviously what just is happening right now uh, is just another confirmation of this. What impact? Do you, can, can you measure the impact this has on consumer behavior? Um, well, the, the, the surprising thing is every time something really bad happens or really difficult happens, luxury is still resilient. Mm -hmm. And that's the question somebody asks yourself, uh, why if you're locked in uh, because it's COVID and you cannot get out, why would you buy a luxury piece? But you still do because you need to reward yourself and it's, it's, an, it's an emotional choice. It's not a necessity. And, uh, and we see that more and more like take India, for example, more and more people, when we looked at our consumer survey, the consumer signals, as we do, we do, do this service regularly on spending, more and more people want to spend on this discretionary and just reward themselves. And, and the, the, um, the proportion of discretionary spending is growing. You know, even if it's difficult sometimes when you just spend on your daily rents and, and food, you have to have something that makes it different. And that's why luxury is so resilient. So it's difficult to say, 
if one or the other event would have a, a particular impact, because look at the watch industry with a lot of disruptions oh, going yeah. on in yeah. 2023, the results are still here. <laughs> no, it's indeed quite crazy. And we're very happy about it, of course. Yeah. <laughs> of course. Um, if you look at your report like five years ago and today, what would be kind of the main differences, the main patterns uh, that have changed between what you had at the time assessed and what's currently going on? Uh, five years ago, we were speaking about um, Swiss made. Uh, is 60 percent the right number? Will it disrupt things? Do, people, do brands have to repatriate some production? Swiss made was a huge topic and the strength of the Swiss franc. And what keeps you up at night was the strength of the Swiss franc. Mm -hmm. Uh, was the Swiss made and smartwatches. Mm -hmm. So these three topics, we hardly comment them now, you know, because even smartwatches is, has now established smartwatch. Yes, yes, they sell, I mean, Apple sells so much more uh, than the Swiss watch industry. Um, I mean, uh, look at all the black boxes that all the people have on their wrists. It is there, but it's more a sports, sportive use, uh, connection use, but it's not, it doesn't show the elegancy, the, the reward myself, the luxury that people like on their wrists. Um, and, and, and the topics like pre-owned, like ESG, like technology, like, like blockchain, I mean, we didn't speak about it five years ago. Mm -hmm. So that's why I say it's a, it's a traditional uh, industry, but it's still an industry that is on full transformation because there is so many new things coming up every year. And brands are capable of adapting, you think? They are. They are. Good. Nice to hear. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much for having us. And uh, congrats for the study and uh, looking forward uh, reading next year's one. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Andre. Thank you so much. Bye, guys.